Hi friends, welcome back to Nobody Knows, the self-help and career development podcast dedicated to the ones who are still trying to figure it all out in life. If this is your first time listening, I'm Juliana and I want to thank you for listening. I'm a 28-year-old who has consistently felt lost in life and like I've always been behind as I navigated my 20s. I created Nobody Knows to share my experience and advice in hopes that we can relate to one another. We also have guests on here from time to time, and we do today to spice things up with a different perspective, knowledge, and expertise of figuring it all out. To the usual crew, I appreciate you tuning in again. If you have been loving this podcast, make sure you're following on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and hit the bell on Spotify to be notified of future episodes. Lastly, I would love your feedback for Nobody Knows Podcast. The best way to do so is either through a five-star review on either listening platform or writing to me directly on either Instagram at Nobody Knows Podcast and on TikTok at Nobody Knows Podcast followed by an underscore. So if I were to ask you, are you familiar with osteopathy? Have you even heard of this practice? What would be your response? I asked this in a poll on Instagram and 30% of you said that it's completely changed your life. 20% of y'all said that you're somewhat familiar but want to hear more. And then the remaining 50% of you said that you didn't have a clue what it was. And I definitely fall into that last category. While I'm trying to be more mindful of taking care of my body, I'd say that I'm still stuck in that stereotypical mindset that working out and eating properly is going to be the only way to take care of myself. I'm more aware of it now that that's clearly not the case and that's not the only way but I do still find my internal dialogue being super critical and judgmental of other means of healing my body but today's conversation is great because our guest really opened up my eyes and helped to further change those preconceived ideas of how to take care of ourselves and furthermore feel confident comfortable and grounded in our bodies Today, we're joined by Florence Bowen, an osteopathic care provider and movement enthusiast in Toronto. Her mission is to provide functional care for all. With an eclectic background that includes competitive athletics and dance, yoga and Pilates instruction, and a deep knowledge of human kinetics, Flo brings a holistic approach to her care. Florence graduated with a kinesiology degree from McMaster University. She then completed her osteopathic training at the Canadian College of Osteopathy in Toronto and later defended her thesis, which examined the effects of osteopathic treatment on diastasis recti. So that's the condition of overstretched abdominal muscles during and after pregnancy. She mentions that for as long as she can remember, she's dreamt of creating a physical space that holds a strong identity and cultivates community. For the past decade, her teaching and clinical practice has been dominated by perinatal and pediatric care, and she's super passionate about educating and supporting soon-to-be parents, new parents, and all of their babies. She also likes to work in collaboration with other healthcare providers to optimize and promote the self-healing mechanism of the body. She integrates all manual therapy with functional strengthening and mobility. And like I said, when I first connected with her, I truly had like next to zero knowledge on osteopathy and its many benefits. So this episode is for anyone like me who is just curious about osteo and if they'd be suitable for it. Plus, this episode's also for anyone who already knows about osteopathy and is just looking to learn more. Osteopathy is a manual or hands-on approach that focuses on how joints, muscles, nerves, circulation, and connective tissues work together to improve one's overall well-being. Osteopathy is great for anyone who deals with conditions that affect the muscles, bones, and joints such as lower back pain and complicated neck pain, shoulder pain, and elbow pain. And of course, osteos can get a little bit more specialized as Flo does with peri and postnatal women. In this episode, we're discussing the benefits of osteopathy, the importance of pelvic health, and Flo's entrepreneurial journey as she just opened up her private practice a little over a year ago. Thanks so much, Florence, for being here today on Nobody Knows Podcast. I have really enjoyed getting to know you more. I'm really grateful. Uh, Shout out to Jess for introducing us, but just getting to know you more. Yes, totally. (laughs) It's been 
really great just hearing your expertise and learning a little bit more about osteopathy and that whole practice because I am very, I'm not really knowledgeable on it. And I think a lot of our listeners are not knowledgeable as well. And a lot of listeners are women. And I think that there are a lot of benefits in osteopathy. So really looking forward to hear more about your experience. Let's start it from the top. What are you currently figuring out right now in life? So this could be big or small. It could be related to your practice or it could even be personal. Well, first off, I'm very happy to be here. And yes, shout out to Trey Posh, Jess, yes. Jessica, if you're listening. <laughs> She's like my momager right now. Yeah, we love her. Okay, I'll keep it like light and sweet. So right now, I'm, I feel like I'm always trying to figure out a lot of things doesn't really change in your 30s apparently right now I'm trying to kind of figure out my new essential makeup kit that is Ooh. all clean product okay I love so, this like, yes so I feel like you and hopefully your listeners maybe they can drop me some hints but there's yeah. obviously you can find clean products but like which ones actually work um, right yeah that's really like just to keep things light and sweet. That's what I'm trying to figure out right now. I love that. I, I love beauty. Do you have any like holy grails of clean products that you found so far that you really like? I do like Ilya, right? Is that how you say it? Yes. It's so a good brand. Of, out of it, but I do. I really love their mascara. I just bought the mascara and I tried some. Again, I have their like tinted moisturizer. Right. Is and... that the one in the bottle where it has like the, yeah. the what is it called? The squeeze yes like the like the dropper Test tube. yes the dropper okay. yes Drop. like, what is the name of it yeah it's like uh, a beautiful bottle yes yeah their branding's like super simple and clean yeah and well done i tried their lip oil i really liked their lip oil i tried mm -hmm. tower have you heard of tower i no. love tower. it's like i think it's called like tower 28 which i don't yeah. really get what the 28 stands for but yes i know which brand you're talking about i use the spray that's in the red bottle as almost okay. like a makeup setting spray, also like refresh throughout the day. Okay. Um, and you like I do it. like that. Yeah, I do. It's it has some additional properties that like helps against the environment or like any sort of elements with the environment against your skin so it protects against things like that so it's one thing that hasn't like really contributed to my acne because I'm really acne prone so I'm also in the sense of like I do want to find things that are like clean but at the same time if it helps my acne I might make a concession for some products just it helps but yeah I love that that's a really fun thing that you're figuring out it's crazy I'm definitely trying like i I mean, just reading ingredients and totally understanding what I'm putting yeah. on, like on my body, what I'm using in my household, like from cleaning products to like shampoo and conditioner and body wash and looking for mm -hmm. those things like that are fragrance free, phthalate free, paraben free, and then yeah. also like talc free. It's pretty like gross. Yeah, makeup. that's a new one. Eh? That's yeah. just like sort of come up in the last few years of like, that's like awful for you. And we've all been yeah. using it. Yeah, I just got my a Fenty sample and I was like, I love Riri. Anybody yeah. knows that I love Rihanna. I was like, oh, there's talc in her foundation. That's so weird. Is it? That's yeah. like actually a little bit disappointing because I feel like when she came out, well, first off, she came out with so many different foundation uh, shades. So like mm -hmm. it was really, really inclusive. And like also it worked on like everyone's skin type. Yeah. So like everyone loved the foundation. And so it sucks that she has some like talc in some of her products. It's probably mm -hmm. really hard also to like make a product that's like cost effective and not use those types of products because they're probably yeah. cheaper. But yeah. yeah, that's challenging. I think, and I, you know what, I'm only speaking to like the one sample I got. Maybe she has, I think she has yeah. a foundation that's better, like much better and acne safe. Like, okay. yeah, okay. I'll get back to you on that one. Okay, love it. <laughs> Can you share with our listeners a bit about yourself and your journey as an osteopath care provider and movement enthusiast? Yeah, so I mean, it, it goes back many years. So I would say that I grew up in Toronto. I'm a Toronto girly. I'm one of six kids. I'm the wow. oldest girl of six kids. That's um, a lot. I feel yeah. like that's a lot of responsibility. And I feel like that's important to know because it threads into what I do, I think. And it totally. like obviously shapes me as like as a per it shaped me as a person. But yeah, I grew up in Toronto. I'm one of six. I have two brothers. I'm like sandwiched in between two boys. So I grew up super active, mm -hmm. very sporty, like love running. I loved, I played ice hockey. I played ball hockey. I was very immersed in the sports world. I really yeah. thought 
that's what I could do for a living was just play sports and school I didn't really like until I got into like probably grade eight and I started to enjoy sciences but I never really thought of myself as a smart girl I was always very like one of the yeah. guys in a way but I had like a very strong foundation in being physically active and I loved it and when I got into high school I started to dance more so I went to an art school in Toronto yeah. and I was exposed to dance as a child my mom put me in Irish step dancing because she wanted me to be a river dancer that's so different and unique that's really interesting yeah she wanted me to be a river dancer for sure I actually enjoyed it I kind of I don't know by the time I was like maybe 12 I was just focusing on my hockey on my right. on sports but that's all to say that I, I definitely when I got to high school was really intrigued by as I started to dance more and more just like understanding the body understanding mm -hmm injuries and recovery and biology I really started to dive into kind of more of the sciences like I said and when it came to university and I know you talked about this before on your podcast which I thought was so brilliant because I was lost like I really didn't know yeah. what I wanted to do I thought maybe I'd pursue dance but my mom was like mm -mm, not until you get a degree which you know, thank God she did that. I applied everywhere. Like I applied in the East Coast, but I only applied for kin at one university. Mm -hmm. And honestly, that was just kind of like the first taste of intuition, I would say. Like I got in, I was lucky enough, I got into a few mm -hmm. options, but kin just felt like the it made the most sense for me. Yeah. And so, yeah, I went to Mac. McMaster University. I got a science degree in Kin and I danced while I was there. I loved Mac. Wow. Great time there. But I still felt kind of confused when it came to like, okay, what's next? Because Kin is yeah. a stepping stone. But I had the the luck of being exposed to osteopathy in my third and fourth year at Mac because my favorite prof was finishing his thesis so he was studying osteopathy in Toronto so that's really where I kind of got exposed to osteo and I just loved his knowledge of anatomy and, and physiology I just thought it was so fascinating that somebody could know these things like the back of his, his hand yeah. so yeah that's really what led me to osteopathy and also the understanding like physio didn't feel right for me didn't feel yeah. encompassing Cairo didn't either and that's what like a lot of my classmates were doing and in your 20s you're like I don't know you're <laughs> out I'm not sure so true and uh, yeah I really definitely gravitated towards more of holistic approaches I would say like I, yeah. I just like, yeah the physical body that's great but there's also you know the psychological emotional mm. like there's so much more to a person and I felt like I couldn't get that holistic for lack of a better word education just with right. like physio or chiro and that's what yeah. I'm just saying like you know a lot of those practitioners are incredible um mm -hmm. but I just wanted to kind of know it all and I felt like osteo gave me a bit more of that mm -hmm. I love that that's really interesting and I love that you had almost like a role model or like a mentor and that one professor that sort of like guided you or like even showed you the possibilities uh, with osteopathy that uh, was even out there for you to even explore. I feel like, especially in your 20s, we can, while we don't know what we're doing, we can also fall into the trap of like, we're just going to do what our friends are doing or the close people around us. So like uh, yeah. students, because you, one may not know that osteopathy exists or any other options. So you're just like, fine, I'll just do what everyone else does. And that can set you up like poorly in the long run when you realize oh this isn't actually what I want to do and Ken is like a very competitive program like it's a lot full of jocks and like I wasn't one of those but you know like and everyone's mm -hmm. doing physio and you're like well then I should do physio. yeah yeah but yeah I'm having a mentor is huge I was lucky enough to be able to like pick his brain a bit more mm -hmm. before and I t definitely advocate for anyone interested in you know trying to just still figuring it out which I feel like we all are like ask questions yeah email somebody talk to them before you commit yourself to a five-year program or that yeah what inspired you to focus on women's mental and physical wellness in your practice well I think I think I was almost bred and brought up to appreciate babies and pediatrics so as like again the oldest girl 
I have three younger sisters, but I was kind of bred to be a little bit of like a mom in lots of different life circumstances. I was always kind of like a little mom to yeah. my sisters, I, I think. So I always had a general interest in like pediatrics and with pediatrics comes moms. And even when I did my osteo schooling, I was like, I can't wait for the pediatric portion like everybody mm-hmm. always kind of knew that my youngest sister is actually a midwife so it's kind of just like oh, wow that's yeah. like a nice connection I know I know she's in London actually oh really um, yeah yeah she's in London she's great so yeah we were, we were I think we're, as a family we're very like mm-hmm. pediatric focused and I think I've always been interested in women's health and especially just the function of our bodies more in like an empowering way I would say yeah. like yeah this is like I it was really late to get my period. I was like the l- latest person in my friend group. And mm-hmm. I even remember then being curious, like fully trying to understand right. the cycle and like, why wasn't I getting my period? And anyways, that kind of like, I've always had this general interest, but I would say that it all came to a head when I, I had a miscarriage when I was 23, mm-hmm. which ended up being an ectopic pregnancy so an ectopic pregnancy is when the embryo embeds somewhere other than the uterine wall so in my case it's my fallopian tube it wasn't a planned pregnancy I did not even you know know I was really pregnant but it was really traumatic for me like extremely Mm -hmm. traumatic I had to have emergency surgery and I got out of the procedure and you know got sent home and luckily you know everything was okay I got to you know I had kept my ovaries, kept my fallopian tubes, like sometimes weren't that lucky. And, but I just got home and I remember just trying to process, obviously I'm dealing with all of like the calm down of the hormones yeah. and recovering from surgery and processing it all. And just thinking like, I, I had no follow-up appointment. I didn't know who to talk to. I was so young. I didn't know what I was doing. Mm-hmm. And I just thought to myself, like, Here's another example of the lack of care for, I think, women in general. But I also thought, like, if I'm dealing with this and struggling so much, like, how does a, a new mom, like, what's a, the care that's available right. for a mother or some, a woman who's maybe dealing with extremely excruciating, painful periods? And there's just this, like, lack of access yeah. to care, I would say. There's this gap. There's a huge gap. I think it's getting much better, but there's a huge gap in, in care out there. So I would say that it's, it took me a while, but eventually I got to a place where I was able to think like, okay, this traumatic event happened for me rather than to me. And right. how can I use what I've learned and the, like, the compassion that I've gained, I would say, for mm-hmm. others who are struggling, say that be like, in the postpartum period or, you know, post a massive C-section and like, there's just a totally. like, little lack of information out there. So honestly, my mission is to try and make that, like close that gap in care and mm-hmm. educate and empower women. And I, that's really what I'm super passionate about. I love that. Well, thank you very much first off for being like so vulnerable and sharing your experience. Cause that just like hearing you talk about that, like I've never experienced something like that, but I I could feel like the emotion and I, I just want to say thanks for sharing that experience with us all because it definitely gives more context into obviously what you're doing here mm-hmm. and like why you are so passionate about what you currently do. And I think too that there are a lot of like care providers who deal with a lot of traumatic events or traumatic situations or illnesses. But I think there's a someone who has experienced said illness or experience or event has that extra level of compassion that someone who hasn't will never relate to, right? And there's like a, a specific, I don't want to say skill set or like expertise, but it is in a way of like how to treat patient, right? Especially with things that are so, they consume your whole body, right? And your whole life. Yeah, I think that there's also like, there's the more you talk about it, like the more you start to hear more about, people start to share and people start right. to open up. And, you know, once I so start to, but there's so many people who have dealt with early loss, late loss, like there's, you mm-hmm. know, a huge spectrum, but you usually you can find the support like the, by opening up about it, it took me yeah. a little while but yeah I think it definitely informs my practice and my ability to kind of empathize yeah I think so I think 
I think that goes for a lot of different, obviously, like range of conditions and diagnoses, but it is a huge reason why I'm so passionate about it. Can you talk about what is the main focus and the purpose of osteopathy? Okay, so I think it's important first to clarify that like osteo is a bit different around the world. Um, okay, that's interesting. Different. Yeah, so I think it will kind of play into like maybe clarify a few things. Like mm -hmm. first, but starting off that osteopathy in Canada, like osteopathic manual practitioners in Canada. So in Canada, we osteopaths are manual therapists, meaning that mm -hmm. we do everything hands-on, we assess hands-on, we treat hands-on. In the States, in America, there's osteopathic physicians. So they're doctors. Oh. Completely different schooling. Yeah. And so there, there are some osteopathic physicians in Canada, but they would have been trained in the U.S. In the States. Like, okay. Not Canada. And then there's also osteopaths in Europe. Lots and lots of osteos in Europe. Like a lot of people from France, Italy. Yeah. And when I was on my honeymoon in France, we were like, osteopath, osteopath, like everywhere. There's tons of osteopaths. They usually see their osteopath before they see their family doctor. Right. Do you watch The Crown? Or of watch course. The Crown? Okay, of course. so Queen Elizabeth, did you ever see the scandal with the osteo? There was okay, well, I've watched the whole series, but what, like, is this when she was, like, younger or older? Or was it older? It's Philip, like, Elizabeth's husband, right? Yeah. Had an osteopath that he saw, and then there was some scandal. I think the osteopath oh. introduced him to a ballet. Okay. And there was a suspected affair. Okay, is this when he was, like, in, when he was the young, like, the yeah. early um, seasons? Okay, I think yeah. I do remember this. Um, yeah. Yeah. You're, you're remembering it. But they mention an osteopath a lot in The Crown because in the UK, like especially in England, there's osteos everywhere. And it's kind of similar. And they're manual therapists in Europe. Okay. So that's like, a, I think, a really important distinction, first and foremost. So like, let's just, we'll take it back to like osteo in Canada and in Ontario, I guess. Osteopathic manual practitioners or osteos approach the body from a hands-on, like it's a hands-on approach, like I said. So we view the body as one interconnected, integrated whole, meaning okay. like to kind of simplify that, we study the different systems of the body, like the muscle body, the nervous system, circulation, the fascial body, the cranial sacral system, and we look at how they kind of all these different systems interconnect, kind of communicate with one another. And we approach it more from a sense of we view the body as wanting to tend towards normality. The body wants to maintain homeostasis or balance. But at times, for example, you know, if there was some sort of an accident or an injury, the body may not be able to totally find that balance again on its own. And so right. osteopathy helps by removing kind of some of those obstacles or some of those restrictions to allow the body to heal itself. Because we do believe that the body has this like innate ability to heal itself or an innate ability to, you know, find balance and find right. normality. So the way that we address that is by like hands-on technique. Right. Sometimes that looks like just like really light kind of intuitive palpation or touch. And sometimes it looks a bit more like joint mobilizations. A lot of the osteos in Europe are very structural, almost like similar to a Cairo, like offering mm -hmm. adjustments, but they're a little bit smaller in terms of their range of motion. Yeah. But in, in short, like to kind of like wrap it up in my like little elevator pitch, we really view the body as one whole system and like full of different parts, but our mission is to facilitate. Yeah, that does make sense. So it's like looking at the body holistically and like treating it overall. And obviously you, like you said, with your hands-on approach versus like, I feel like when you go to physio, you're only t looking at like, I had to go fit to physio for my knee. Right. And like we only worked on rehabilitating my knee and like doing specific exercises for those muscles and ligaments. Right. Yeah. No, it's kind of like that. The hip bones connected to the, you know. Yeah. So one easy example. I know we're going to talk about it a bit more, but I, I tell women all the time your pelvic floor and your the tension in your pelvic floor is related to the tension in your jaw and your TMJ. So 
Yes, I worked with so many pelvic floor physios. I think pelvic floor physios are incredible. And they would often refer to me to do more of that like whole body. Okay, this person has a tight pelvic floor. What other Mm -hmm. structures in their body might be tight that could be contributing or restricted that might be contributing. Kind of limiting them from fully Mm -hmm. recovering. And yeah, we can chat about that. But a lot of the time, people who clench their teeth often have really tight pelvic floor. Interesting. That's a fun fact. I didn't know that. Yeah. Can you share more about why you think that not a lot of people, and more specifically women, as you mentioned, are familiar with osteopathy and recognize its benefits? I think it's a bit because, first of all, osteo is not regulated in Ontario. So they're very close to regulating, I think, in in Quebec, but it's not a regulated practice. So Mm -hmm. I think, you know, when anything isn't regulated, there's maybe a bit of hesitancy, you know, why isn't it regulated? And it is a bit difficult to explain, to be honest, like you can probably hear it in, in my voice, but it is a bit difficult to explain. And it is fairly new, even in, Mm -hmm. in Canada, it's, the school's only been around, at least we're celebrating like 25 years of having an association. It's pretty new. And I think that there's just still kind of like a lack of understanding and access, maybe. Like, I think it's right. getting a lot better, but there That's aren't true. that many osteos. It's getting yeah. better. And do you feel like it's like, I don't want to say woo-woo because it's a legitimate accreditation and like mm-hmm. an actual practice, but to say that it you view the body from like a holistic view and like everything's interconnected so like if someone comes in with I don't know like shoulder pain or something and you go to their hip or whatever of course I'm not an osteopath so maybe that's not even proper like connection you know what I mean but you go somewhere that's not actually where their pain point is Mm -hmm. and it I assume is it also like needs to be a gradual process it's not like you just come once and then you're cured is it you have repeated sessions usually I think because it's like again because it's like not very well understood A lot of people find you at the end, they've tried everything else. And so they Mm. come to an osteo and that's common if they've had, you know, their pain or their discomfort might be chronic. So yeah, usually, you know, it could take, it depends, but it could take only a few sessions, but our, our mission is not to keep you. Yeah. That's definitely not the, the goal of osteopathic treatment, but Mm -hmm. yeah, it's usually, but you're right. You know, I could definitely be working on someone's hip when they came in for shoulder pain and I think the important piece is like your osteo should be able to explain why they're doing that yeah and then it becomes woo-woo if you can explain (laughs) why you know yeah I'm I'm working on your the opposite hip through you know because of flexors are connected to your diaphragm your thoracic diaphragm is is connected to your ribs if you can explain that then it makes it feels less yeah True. It gives like a purpose that you explaining all that reminds me of that one song, like something's connected to your yeah, whatever bone. Exactly. Exactly. But no, that, that definitely makes sense. How do you integrate your passion for movement into your treatment approach? So I, I know we've talked about this, but I just, and our love for Pilates, but I'm just in the process of finishing up my um, mm-hmm. mat certification. But I'm, um, after doing dance and leaving university, I got my yoga cert. So I was teaching yoga for years and teaching kind of like Pilates principles, I would say for years when I was in school for osteo I was working in restaurants and I was teaching movement like I've always just grind the grind the hustle (laughs) and I would say like movement is so important so I use movement as into sometimes integrative exercises Mm -hmm. so after osteo treatment I might give some stretches and some strengthening exercises to complement the treatment And it's very like personalized. It's based on the individual. Yeah. And that might just be a few movements, a few stretches, a few exercises. Sometimes depends what somebody's goal is. You know, if I'm working with somebody postpartum who's looking to strengthen their core and their pelvic floor, then our our osteo session might look a bit more like some manual therapy and then a lot of exercise. Yeah. That's really interesting. You also specialize in pelvic health, as you just talked about, as that can be a main reason women seek osteopathic care. Can you also elaborate further on why pelvic health is so important? Pelvic health is everything. Mm -hmm. So I think it's like when somebody 
a woman like is educated or understands that they have a pelvis and a pelvic floor it's like the most empowering thing but yeah I so first when I was writing my thesis I wrote my thesis on a condition called diastasis rectus abdominis so in short that's just like the overstretching of the line of tissue between your six-pack muscle so during pregnancy 100% of of women will develop a diastasis so it's that like that thinning mm. and the stretching between the six-pack muscle it needs to happen to create space for the baby and the uterus that's like growing to the size of a watermelon so you need it needs to happen the body needs to do mm -hmm. it and a lot of the time that comes back on its own postpartum and sometimes it doesn't sometimes it needs right. a little bit of rehab a little bit of progressive overload just like you would rehab a knee injury like you were talking about. But with that, I was really exposed to pelvic, the pelvic floor and, the pel and pelvic health in general because you can't rehab your abs, as we like to think of them, like the six-pack muscle, which is just like, I don't know, kind of like the fluffy muscle. It's not that yeah. exciting. It, it is, you know, if you're looking on Instagram and you want six-pack yeah. abs, but... Totally. It, yeah, it's not really doing that much. But with that, I, I really started to dive into like the pelvic floor. And I ended up working with an incredible clinic called Proactive Pelvic Health in Toronto, which is was primarily a pelvic floor physio team. And I was the only at the time osteopathic manual practitioner, but I was exposed to so much and I learned so much at that mm -hmm. clinic. And again, it just kind of like fed the passion for educating, right. understanding, you know, all of these different pelvic conditions. I was exposed to a lot more chronic pelvic pain, like endometriosis and PCOS and like lots of like really, I would say more complicated cases. So again, I think pelvic in general, we're not really taught. Nobody's really taught about right. the floor. Yeah. Um, have a pelvic floor too. But our pelvic floor and pelvic health in general is just not very well educated. Function of the pelvic floor totally. is super empowering, especially to, I would say especially to women. But, you know, both men and women can benefit from understanding more about right. their pelvic floor and, pel and pelvic health in general. Yeah, like I don't, to be honest, like the only time I ever was aware of like pelvic floor health was when my one sister was pregnant for the first time. Mm -hmm. She did a lot of work while she was pregnant before she gave birth, make her more comfortable when she was giving birth. I think it definitely helped her when she gave birth because also her baby like literally like, almost like flew out of her. Like she just felt like it was the most comfortable experience she could have possibly had. And she, wow. I think, credits a lot of like pelvic floor. I think she worked with this, maybe a pelvic floor specialist. I'm not sure. Yeah. I don't believe she worked with an osteo. But she did do a lot of work prior to giving birth and she like swears by taking care of her pelvic floor and like even being aware of it. And then also I feel like because we always associate it with like being pregnant, you mm -hmm. have talked about how it can also help women who are not pregnant, especially women who experience like painful sex. Mm -hmm. And we talked about this in our discovery chat. Like I have some friends who have said, yes, I like experience pain during sexual intercourse and I didn't really realize that it's a lot more women than we think. Like yeah. majority of women. I yeah. looked up like stats and it's like 75% of women will experience pain like at least once in their life during sexual intercourse. Yeah. Which is like, that's a lot. That's astounding. Shocking. Uh, I didn't even know that. And then also that we're not talking about it. And you mentioned like the shame of no one talking about it. So no one's going to come forward. But once we start talking about it, then more people or especially mm -hmm. specifically more women will come forward. So I think I sort of just answered this a little bit, but do you have any more insight as to why you think this is so? Like, why are there so many women that are experiencing this? And also what advice would you give women who are going through this and trying to figure out like a proper treatment plan? First, I would say, I think that's such a loaded question. I have so much love and respect for the pelvic floor physio. So to just to clarify, as an osteo, I'm not doing pelvic floor physio. I am not doing any type of internal work. An osteo who is doing internal work is not working within their scope. Important to know. As an osteo, I'm working more on what are the bones that help support the pelvic floor. And then also, like I said, the thoracic, the different diaphragms of the body, the thoracic mm -hmm. diaphragm, our breathing muscle is definitely connected to our 
pelvic floor in terms of maintaining pressure and they should work together, not against one another. So as an osteo, I'm looking again, it's more like, how can I support the, the pelvic floor? Yeah. Structures that, that anchor and create kind of those, those fixations for the pelvic floor. So for anyone who doesn't know, the pelvic floor is just like a group of muscles that almost are like they're shaped like a hammock that attach from your pubic bones, like the front of your pelvis to your tailbone. And they work, they really should be able to, like you said, be flexible enough and like mobile enough to help with birth, right? You don't want the muscle to be super, super tight and super, super contracted yeah. all the time. Like that definitely helps us maintain our continence, meaning like we don't, you know, our insides right. are filling out onto the ground. It prevents like urinary incontinence, fecal incontinence, mm -hmm. but also it helps, you know, we should, the pelvic floor needs to be able to relax to allow us to use like void our bowels, use the like pee and then give birth, for example. But right. you want it to be able to like contract and release. Right. And I would say that as women, we are often taught, I mean, especially mm -hmm. as a dancer, you are taught to suck it in. Like nobody wants oh, true. to have their belly hanging out, you know, or that was viewed, like, especially for me, I'm in my thirties. Like I grew up in like the craze of diet culture and, you know, letting your belly go. It was not. A good idea it wasn't like you didn't you were very i don't know very self-conscious about it or as a dancer you taught like pull it in like suck it in draw it up and as mm -hmm. soon as your abs are tight your pelvic floor is going to be gripping if you're gripping mm. through your glutes you're gripping through your hip you're gripping through your abs like trying to suck it in all the time you can bet your pelvic floor is tight it's yeah tonic. And so one part, like to kind of elaborate on your question, like first part with, I would say is unfortunately we've all been conditioned to, you know, be embarrassed of our bodies in some way or some shame around like true having a, a belly yeah. or letting it go. And that's led to hypertonic floors, like tight pelvic floors. Wow. If you have a tight pelvic floor that can definitely lead to painful sex. Your pelvic floor, the muscles have to be like buoyant enough elastic enough to receive mm -hmm. thing if you're having intercourse i think it's like such an important conversation to be had because i think women think that maybe painful sex is normal and it's not it's common i think a big part of that is like you might have a tight pelvic floor for so many different reasons like maybe you're just sucking it in maybe you have had some traumatic experience and you're yeah. gripping and holding through your pelvic floor like you know hopefully it's not that complicated but in a lot of women it is like we yeah. are you know unfortunately like a lot of women it is so even just living in the city and the hustle and the bustle just being up regularly we have that like if you think of like a dog that's yeah. tail when it's scared as soon as we feel scared our pelvic floor yeah. tightens so my first tip would be if you can if you don't feel comfortable seeing a pelvic floor physio who can help you understand you know where you're holding where you're gripping if that's not a possibility you just don't feel comfortable with it which a lot of people don't right mm -hmm. away i would start with more like meditation or breath work to right. release and soften or different stretches to help open up the hip bones, open up the pelvic yeah. bones. Because if the pelvis and the pelvic bones are kind of like in this opening position, it will lengthen, it will open, right. it will help you release your pelvic floor. And then, I mean, you got to talk to your partner, you know, yeah. like that's so important. I think women are just like terrified to say, like it took me forever to be like, yeah. It's really Actually, hard to advocate for yourself, especially yeah. in such a vulnerable position. Really? Yeah. There's other reasons, you know, you might, you might need like lube, for example, or, you know, yeah. different reasons I might be uncomfortable, but I would say for the majority of the case, people are gripping through their pelvic floor and they, they're not even really aware of it. And also something even for men or you don't have to be a man, but like the other partner on the listening end or the receiving end of this feedback of like, it has really nothing to do with you. It's about the person who, or the, the woman in our case of having the pain. Cause yeah. I feel like if someone were to say, I'm having a lot of pain when we have sex or whatever, like people could get offended or mm. take the, internalize that. And then inadvertently reshame the individual who's just like sharing that I'm struggling with this. It's uncomfortable. Yeah. How can we change it up? You yeah. know? So, yeah. And I think like, even to go back to what we were saying before, unfortunately, 
I think women suffer more from pelvic floor dysfunction and like pelvic floor tightness. Like mm-hmm. these pelvic health and like pelvic floor conditions affect women more than they affect men. Mm-hmm. So again, I think it's just to kind of elaborate and kind of go back to like what I was saying in terms of why pelvic health is so important and like women's health is that it's like it's mostly women who are suffering from these pelvic health conditions but there's a lot of shame again right like yeah. you're peeing your pants when you run or something like you don't have to have had a baby to be peeing your pants right. or like leaking yeah. when, you, when you run there's lots of reasons why that might be happening and it's so true it's common but it's not normal and again right. seeking the health of a pelvic floor physio is i think a great first step if you feel comfortable with having you know it does involve an internal exam so if that just feels totally freaky to you it's not always the most helpful. yeah it's definitely not like I don't know. well I mean you go to for like your classic like checkups with your doctor or whatever like the pap smears but yeah it's not like I don't think it'd be like the first thing on your like to-do list that you want to go yeah, to exactly we need but we need again it's like we need to be having these conversations because there's help out there and you know we gotta like try and put the like sh- the shame that mm-hmm. for some reason we, you know, been conditioned to feel mm-hmm. and just get the get the help so that our quality of life is better. You also highlighted that you've just opened your private practice about a year ago. So I want to know now that you're like a business owner and you have your own company, how do you like to stay updated on like the latest developments or resources in osteopathy and like wellness care? So yeah, I did. I opened my practice about a year ago now. I currently sit on the board of director for the Osteo Association. So that helped me keep up to date for sure. We also, if you're a member of the OAO, shout out to the OAO, you get a, you get like a book of journal articles, like the latest cool. um, research for osteo. But I also just, aside from osteo, I love podcasts. I definitely listen to a bunch <laughs> of like health related yeah. podcasts. Right now, I've been diving into a lot of like fertility based podcasts. Mm. I mean, Huberman's always kind of like a good one as mm-hmm. well. But I would say lots of podcasts. And then totally. I'm Constantly, I like to read too. I'm like a Virgo in the full form where I like pull up self help books all the time. And yeah. I dive into. Definitely. Mm-hmm. I love, well, every time I ask that question in relation to each specific guest, they always mention that like podcasts really help them to learn more. And I agree. I love podcasts, one, to just for entertainment purposes, but two, like in, in terms of like self help or educational standpoint like they're free and they just have such a wealth of knowledge and they have so many now that if you don't like the way someone speaks or you don't like the format of a specific podcast you can find that information somewhere else that you do like the forum or the method mm-hmm. that they execute in so yeah agreed I know love podcasts so as I mentioned with your private practice which is called Dear Osteopathy correct yeah I love it it's a great name that is located in Toronto can you elaborate on your experience of going out on your own and like the challenges or the highs and the successes that you experience opening that? Yeah, I mean, leaving proactive pelvic health was really a tough decision for me. I love Ange. I love, you know, shout out to Ange, but I love all the, all, everybody I was working with was just so incredible. But I think like having my own physical space was something that I always really wanted. I really right. wanted to have full control over the physical space, but especially from like a kind of a healing perspective. Right. I mm-hmm. wanted it to feel more like a little bit less clinical and right. more of where people, especially because I see a lot of parents and a lot of new newborns, I wanted to have the ability to offer them a place to post appointments like nurse or chill after mm. a session versus feeling that they have to rush out. So that was just like little things that I really do feel make a difference in terms Mm -hmm. of somebody's healing and recovery. It was definitely something I thought about a lot before I acted on it, but I have no regrets. It was the best decision. I definitely enjoy being my own boss. Um, Mm -hmm. There's definitely more anxiety, you know, more stress. Like it's in some ways, in some ways there definitely is. But it's been like a very, I would say a very rewarding process. And I'm learning so much every day. 
I have the privilege of like my husband is in commercial real estate. So okay. really just, it kind of all happened really quickly. And I right. would say not totally, I did it. I like signed the lease and I was like, oh my God, what did I? Like, yeah, I, probably I, really freaking scary, but you're like, well, here we are. Yeah. I had that moment for maybe a day and then sometimes it comes and goes to be honest, Yeah, but it ebbs and it flows, but it's very rewarding, at least for somebody who my one of my best friends says like Flo you just don't like being told what to do you know I'd be like going like I don't know why like it just this doesn't feel right like I'm not right. fully happy in this position and I don't mm -hmm. know like just thinking about different offers I was given and she was like you're you just don't like being told what to do and having this realization that oh, okay yeah I guess I don't mm -hmm. but there's also perks to having, like, I, I miss working with the team sometimes. I really do, yeah. but I, it's such a social job in a way. Like I'm just seeing people every day, talking to mm -hmm. them, touching them. It's like, it can, it's pretty social. So like mm -hmm. that kind of fills me up in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. That's really exciting. Well, congrats on that. And so what is the anniversary date of when you opened your osteopathy? Um, technically it's, like February 2nd. Okay. So we've yeah. already had the year anniversary. That's like yeah. cast yeah. into the second year. It came by, <laughs> came and went so quickly. I also was like planning a wedding during my year open. Don't recommend that. Do not. That's a lot. That's a lot yeah. of planning. Yeah. It was crazy. It was crazy. But now on the other side and I'm just. Yeah. You're here to tell the together. tale. We talked about osteopathy in terms of it not being super well known, but I want to know how you advocate and get it well known within the community and reiterate your mission with osteopathy and its benefits. Great question. I would use social media quite a bit to promote and kind of educate. I do work on like the PR committee for the OAO, like the Osteo cool. Association. So we have done all sorts of mostly like using social media, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and X or Twitter. Yeah. Know, that's so weird. I've never <laughs> said X before. I know. Um, I know. I, I, I always refer to it as Twitter. Like who's going to say yeah. X? People are like still not going to know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that, those are kind of like the main four platforms, but then lots of outreach in terms of I've done a lot of chats with like mom groups or when I was at proactive pelvic health, we used to do rounds with doctors like and gynees, which was great. I miss, I miss doing that. I haven't done that in a while, but I definitely love speaking about it. And I love the interactive piece of advocating yeah. for osteo. Yeah. We're working definitely hard towards educating the public and then educating kind of allied healthcare practitioners or doctors. Yeah. To really try and promote it, but also improve everybody's understanding and of like our, of our scope mm -hmm. and how we can help. Can you share a success story from starting Dear Osteopathy? Okay. I would say that when I started Dear Osteo, Dear Osteopathy, I really wanted to bring in other practitioners on mm -hmm. with full kind of control and autonomy of their own business because it's not an easy thing to do or to achieve in the healthcare practitioner setting. So mm -hmm. I think that this will like, we can elaborate on this, but typically when you're starting out as like a healthcare practitioner, which is primarily, you know, dominated mostly by women, we end up working in like a split situation. So you provide your service, you are given a portion of the earnings from that service. Obviously, yeah. like you're contributing to the clinic and, you know, having its overhead and having to pay rent and having to pay all the bills. But there's at a point, I guess, for me, it became a bit like, okay, I'd rather be doing this on my own now and kind of having like a lot, definitely a lot more control over my schedule, right. even the ability to like slot in 10 minutes between clients because I yeah. feel like I'm hustling and I'm running because I have yeah. to see clients a day so that, or patients a day so that I can make the same amount of money or like earn the yeah. same amount, which isn't at all like why I, and I don't think anybody really gets into the healthcare space is to make money. But if you're in Toronto, it's, you got to pay your bills. Typically in Toronto, like yeah. So yeah, you have you know, and obviously it's a lot of energy that you're you're putting into, you're you're putting out and putting you know putting out every day, and you want it to feel worth it in a way. But totally. so 
I would say when I started Dear Osteo, I was definitely open to having other practitioners use the space, but I was very clear that I didn't want to be kind of profiting off of them in a way. I wanted them to mm -hmm. be able to bring their own clients in, have their own practice, manage their own practice, be their own boss, but mm -hmm. obviously use the space, respect the space, but just pay kind of like a daily fee for it. And I think that is, that's something that I've been able to like hold true to. So I would say that's like a huge story from Dear Osteo. I have two practitioners and they're now one amazing massage therapist, one social worker, like talk therapist. And it's like a very supportive, encouraging crew. Everybody kind of operates their own little practice, but it's super respectful and, and super, it's nice to yeah. kind of empower other healthcare practitioners that way. Yeah. That's like a huge success story from like the business side, I would say that some, one thing I'm really, I'm proud of because it's not easy to find oh. that set up in right. as a healthcare practitioner. Yeah. Even in Toronto, like the hub of like, you can probably find something in Toronto related to anything that you're on the hunt for, but like it's very limited in your specific field. So I think that that's great that you've created a space for other practitioners to use, but then also you're not accountable, like you're not their boss, right? And like you said, of creating yeah. that good environment where you can collaborate together or you all feel respected on the same level. And then you can just come together and use the space uh, as it's needed. I think that that's really amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's something I'm, I'm really grateful to have met them. Yeah. And I just feel really, I'm definitely proud of, of that. What advice do you have for other entrepreneurs who are navigating their journey within the healthcare industry? I think I kind of touched on it. Like mm -hmm. it's very difficult, I think, as a new healthcare provider I just want to like dive into treatment like I know I did. I was like, I just want to get my hands dirty or just like busy and just get all the, you know, the experience. And I have no regrets about that at all. But I think one piece of advice is like, make sure you're practicing what you preach in terms of take care of your own bodies, take care of your mental health. Like sometimes, mm -hmm. some days can be depending on what work you're doing, but sometimes it can be very heavy days and you want to make sure that you have certain out outlets in place or, you know, different tactics and strategies in terms of how to manage maybe those tough days. Take care of yourself, prioritize taking care of yourself too, because it, it catches up. And, you know, if advocate for yourself, I would say too, like if you need to have an extra five minutes between patients, then communicate it and like ask for mm. it. Because often that's not right. the setup for a lot of people. Often it's like back to back clients and you're just booked because you want to maximize the amount of. Yeah. You know, yeah. You want to maximize. So, and that can get, it depends on what type of person you are. But as for someone like me, who is definitely very sensitive and empathetic, I often yeah. need that 10 minutes. And I would, I would really argue that most healthcare providers are that way. Not always, but like mm -hmm. a lot of them are. And it took me a while to finally be able to communicate, like, you know, now I need 10 minutes between each client, wash my hands, take a breath, go for a walk, recenter myself so that I'm going to the next client, the next patient with a hundred percent of my yeah, attention. Totally. I love that. You shared a little bit about goals and like what you've achieved so far with your osteopathy, but do you have future plans that you would like to share or things that you're currently thinking about moving I mean, ahead? I'm thinking about a podcast. It's something I've thought about forever. So maybe people can comment on what they think I should be talking yeah. about. That'd be great. Um, I would really love to do that. That's like one goal of mine, I would say this year, specifically, you know, what that is going to cover. I'm I have ideas, but I'm not, yeah. I'm not sure what it's very exciting. Like. Thanks. I got to hit you up for yeah the, brainstorm uh, session. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully I'm better at navigating the technical parts of it. Well, yeah. people, we'll get uh, that unlocked for you. But that's a huge, that's one goal um, of mine for sure. And then I think another one is providing a bit more online services maybe, or just virtual yeah. resources for parents and for, you know, postpartum people, I often have, you know, maybe something as simple as I see a lot of babies who are having difficult time breastfeeding or latching. Mm -hmm. And I often give parents like a breakdown of exercises, but having those like 
recorded and easily easy to access or something as simple as like scar care and like that's like little stuff I would say that I'm hoping you know hoping to do over the next I don't think a podcast is a little thing but the the re, the virtual resources I say yeah I, they are you know that's achievable for sure it's just making the time yeah yeah it's kind of hard of going from like being in practitioner mode versus then going to like entrepreneurial mode and like how am I gonna continue push the business further because like they're both very very important right like and they're both somewhat of like your bread and butter like yeah they're equally as weighted so it's a totally different mindset and uh frame of mind that you have to be in I had a really good chat with my osteo this week. I went for osteo treatment and Austin, my husband, is like very business mind, very right. business minded. And I would say, you know, we, we find ourselves like if we're at a dinner with a bunch of his friends from business school, like, you know, way back when they they're like they're the best. They're always yeah. asking about my business. Love and that. I'm often like, I don't really have a business plan like I'm being honest with you right now like I'm being totally uh, upfront. I'm like I just and it's not like I run an intuitive business I wouldn't say that I'm not just like woo, like I'll just go with the flow but I I don't like I said I didn't get into osteo for the financial gain but I and when I'm like being authentic in terms of treating like I want to treat not getting kind of caught up in what do people think of me like am I did I do enough during this session are they satisfied with the session you know I think there's a bit of discomfort too and like asking for money for services I think that's like yeah a, I don't know if that's primarily a, a woman thing I think it is there's a bit of imposter syndrome there for sure uh, which you got to work through but what I'm trying to say is I do kind of trust that if I'm giving my 100%, I'm going to, that's going to be reciprocated in the way that like, I'm going to start to attract people totally. that vibe with me. And I yeah. know that's not a very good business plan, but it <laughs> I know feels, what you mean. I know it, what you mean. Yeah. It feels really, you start to build a practice that compliments you and feels better as a healthcare practitioner and healthcare provider. And obviously having my own business, I'm lucky that I can do that, that I can kind of filter people out or, you know, if they don't love me, then that's okay. Yeah. We're just not the right fit. And I think I'm just starting to get to that place now where I'm feeling good, kind of setting those boundaries and not being as thirsty, I guess, in some ways, just for any client. Like I want to make sure that I'm bringing in people who, who drive with me and who I connect with. And I think that that's, you know, maybe not the best, I don't know if that's the best business I think it is though, because I think it's like, you need to learn not to take things personally, especially as a healthcare provider. You Very true. To, yeah, you have to, you can't, otherwise it's just, it can definitely gobble you up in terms yeah. of just consume like, you break. and yeah. yeah. Last week, before we wrap up, can you tell listeners where they can find you? So if that's online or in person? Yeah. So I do have my two kind of Instagram accounts. So I have my business account, which is just at Dear Osteopathy. And then my personal account is at Florence.Bowen. So you can find me on Instagram. I have my website too. If you want to learn a little bit more about me. Hmm osteopathy in general and just kind of like what the scope of osteopathy is you have a little bit you know a few more questions you can also reach out to me there that's just dearosteopathy.com and I am I'm in Toronto my clinic is in Leslieville like Queen and Carlaw you can book online through the website but if you're not sure you have questions like feel free to reach out to me either through Instagram or through my website form that works too. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Florence. I had, I, I feel way more knowledgeable just you explaining the specific process. It's almost like a kind of like a consultation maybe of like how you would explain like what's going to happen of like <laughs> when you get started with your practice, but I'm very intrigued. So maybe I will be reaching out for some services because I yeah. feel like um, on this journey of trying to heal my body overall, I feel like I have some specific ailments or like conditions that I'm trying to treat right now, but I'm definitely this year way more into like exercise as just movement and just moving my body every day because that's good for me. I'm trying to like do things that are good for me overall so that I feel better as well as feel like whole. I definitely live that life where like 
some parts of my body are okay or I'm confident in, and then other parts I like absolutely hate or despise. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I don't know if this is also with age getting older, but like, I'm just becoming kinder to myself as well. And I think that that has taken some work to be that way, but I also want to like value and respect my body too. That's the work. It's hard work to do that hard work. Yeah. But I think it's amazing that you're conscious of it and like trying to detangle or untangle yourself from those. That's a really good way to put it. It's like untangling things. Cause yeah, I definitely feel like that's a perfect way to put it. Cause I, I just feel like there's the, I've known that things are like not essentially so right with specifically my mental health or some physical things going on. And now I'm slowly becoming more aware of them and like addressing them. So yeah, but I just wanted to say thank you very, very much. And I know we're all eager to see where dear osteopathy goes in the future. And just thank you so much for sharing your insights and taking some shame away, especially for women about what might be going on in our bodies and making us all feel a little bit more comfortable. I hope so. No, thanks so much for having me. So much fun. And I love what you're doing. I think I wish I had found a podcast like this when I was in my 20s. So well, thanks so much. I appreciate that. Um,